you had a Cadillac for sale, did you not? Or did you post it? What's it? What are you? Hey, you're man. the caddy guy. If you're not hustling, can... you're sleeping. Yeah. So right. this wasn't it. This was not the Cadillac for sale. Yeah. This is the caddy from season one, episode uh, season one, episode six, triple black Cadillac. Is that a three? What year is that? Four. Four. Six. Very. I mean, well, how would you know? You know. Oh, that's just the other day when I picked it up. That's badass. Right? Those wheels are kick ass too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to fall in love all over again looking at these pictures. <laughs> right. Let's go for a ride, Shag. You clearly had too much blood in your alcohol system. Listen, what I didn't say I stopped drinking on Sunday. I'm just telling you that yeah, I'm still hung over from those days. Oh, yeah, God. I'm, my that ass is, is a dragon. And I turned around and I said, you just missed 10 grand. He goes, why? And I said, because that was me being a dick. <laughs> <laughs> no Boom. fucking way. Like, no way. How'd you get imagine there's no situation in the world where somebody thinks Lou was too loud? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can hear you laugh. From here, not through the stream, but from here. <laughs> That's so, true. That, that is true. <laughs> I'm too- Hold on for a sec. Do you think we should explain these hats or not? Just keep on going? Just keep on going. <laughs> Just keep on going. Right. No, 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 right. no, pick it up when we bring on our guest. You need to do is check out DEI Design Engineering Incorporated. They keep the heat out so you're not sweating to death. Check them out. <laughs> I do like that. I do like that. <laughs> it's perfect and it's perfect for this show. It really is. <laughs> that first DEI commercial was the bomb. That thing was the best. <laughs> We thought so too. It's why we use it. It's okay. Yeah. (laughs) Been with my wife since '94. Met her in '94. Got married in '97. Lou, when we met, she said, "Don't even talk about sex until we get married." After we were married, she said, "You can talk about it all you want." (laughs) 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 It ain't happening. I tell you, I got it rough. I'll tell you. <laughs> I think there was like probably four, 30 or 40 extras, you know, on set that day. And when they started asking, you know, who here can drive a six this is like 30 or 40 extras, none of them could. What? <laughs> you know, and it's like, then the directors, you know, I mean, why'd you bring these cars with clutch pads? It's like, well, that's the only way these old Land Cruisers came. There was no right. automatic. So, anyways, <laughs> we had to test a couple of my mechanics as terrorists and put them in the cars to. <laughs> so, uh, it's cool. It's cool. It's got this different strokes, strokes, different strokes, you know. But, but you start getting dizzy. There you go. Hey, Ken's got to throw that up. He's breaking my balls ever since. Look at that guy. Look at that librarian. Man, we could yeah. talk for weeks about this stuff.
Hey everybody, it's Lou Santiago, and we have got a fantastic fo show for you tonight. We have got the man, the myth, the legend, Butch, Pat Butch Patrick. Sorry about that, I bobbled. But let me tell you guys before we get into who Butch Patrick is. These are some of the shows that he has been on. The Real McCoys, Death Valley, My Favorite Martian, Bonanza, Rawhide, Mr. Ed, A Horse is a Horse, Gunsmoke, I Dream of Genie, The Monkees, Family Affair, Marcus Welby, MD, My Three Sons. We're talking about the guy who played Eddie Munster, but that's not all. We're not just going to talk about the Munsters. I know that's what you guys are thinking. Butch is a car guy, and John actually met him at the race in Jersey on Dead Man's Curve. So we're going to take a break. We're going to get into it because Butch's time is tight, so we want to get going. Let's go. Let's go. What you need to do is check out DEI, Design Engineering Incorporated. They keep the heat out so you're not sweating to death. Check them out. <laughs> Yo. John! What's happening? <laughs> What's First, happening, I got to show you. Got to show you. Check Dude, that's out. so awesome. Right? Did you get me one? Hey, look. Did you get me crap. one? No. Nah, Did you get me one? Nah, fuck you. <laughs> fucking bag. <laughs> Yo, do I have a Garage Insider shirt? No. Nah, I got one of those. You don't get one. Of those. I'm going to send you one. How about that? <laughs> All right, that's cool. Talk to Butch. I'm sure we could arrange something. <laughs> So do you see I, I had to cut the ceiling out of, out of the room? I had to cut the ceiling the, uh, out. The vents. Yeah, I'm getting the ducting done. They came in yesterday and measured everything up. So it's gonna oh, be shit. it's just gonna be insane. Everything's on back order till November. Easily. Yeah. Everything is you know, it's from everything's China. imported. It's imported from China. Yeah. China. <laughs> Listen, uh, we got Butch for 30. Yeah, let's get going. Let's bring him out because we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, like you said, I mean, that's a lot of shows, and they're they're all big ticket, big ticket, big big shows. There show. he is. There, there he is. is. Butch, how you doing, man? Hey, Butch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, if, if, if he could be looking foo, I want to be Batch Putcher. <laughs> <laughs> we can go and change it. We can change it up on you. <laughs> you like the luck in food, don't you? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Do it. Make it yours. Take it. <laughs> so, but, but I got to be, you know, now let me tell you how this works, all right? Because I'm sure you, you, you don't know. John is the one who likes to keep to some kind of order as to where I just run all willy nilly, okay? So, the, the biggest question I got for you is I know you used to hang out at George Barris's shop when you were doing the shows. Was that is was that the event that made you become a car guy? That's what I want to know. Well, it certainly didn't hurt. I'll tell you that. But as a kid, right, uh, right about the time I started doing the Munsters, I got my first mini bike and the go kart, and then the Hodaka ninety, and then that led up to the you know the the, the street bikes and the, and the Mach one. So uh, I was already on that path, but being around George, I was lucky enough to really see the custom side of the Mercs and all the cool rides that he had been yeah. instrumental in doing. And then the TV cars and the movie cars came along after that. But the main thing about George, he was he allowed a little kid, me, a little boy, to come to his shop and poke around and see some interesting stuff and really fall in love and, uh, and learn a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, That's think awesome, about man. that. Think about that for a second. The time I, I am of Butch being on TV, all those top shows, because every one that you listed is huge. I mean, yeah. it's huge. Then he's with the legend George Barris. Yeah. How cool. Oh, is yeah. That? And, and you know, we met a couple other. Who, <laughs> what other legends did you meet? Well, Which? The, the list on that thing was really cool. Uh, the Monkeys Christmas show was one of my favorites. A 14 year old kid, you know, the Monkeys were huge, and I got to work with them for a whole week as an equal, which was really wonderful. But um, 
the My Three Sons connection was one of my favorites because my, my agent, Mary Grady, her son was Don Grady, who obviously played Robbie. And um, I was always Ernie's best friend, but I did nine episodes, which was the most of any male guest star during the entire run of the show. So I felt very honored. Wow. On there a lot. And I and I always was Ernie's best friend. And it was and it was fun. It was like I was part of the they called me part of the tribe when they got their their LA at My Three Sons Day. I attended, they invited me out. I was very honored. But one of the things Wow, that's mention, cool. One of the things you didn't mention was I was lucky enough to work on the only feature film Chuck Jones did called The Phantom Toll Booth. And um, as a kid watching my favorite cartoons, you know, Warner Brothers cartoons, all the Great voiceover artists, uh, Mel Blanc, uh, uh, let me see, uh, June, June Foray, uh, Hans Conry, Dawes Butler, they all worked for Chuck in that movie. So I actually had a chance to work for a few years with them as well, which was really a big deal to me. Uh, as yeah. As being the voiceover uh, greats up close and working with them side by side. Yeah, see, I think that's cool, man. See, John didn't put that in there when he did the write up. You know, it's because John was well, slacking, and, obviously. And you have some pictures from Blitzville and stuff, and, you know, there's a couple of Adam 12s tossed in there. But I had a, you know, I worked for about 15 years in the business, and I did quite a bit of work. I was, I was pretty happy. Let's awesome. back up, Butch, back up to the beginning. How did you get into the business? Uh, what was life like? I mean, part of me is like, man, it's fantastic. The other part is, I mean, you missed your childhood. Did you not? I mean, you're you're working as an adult. Well, you, you know, it's when people say you missed your childhood, you, you, you know, you're a child. So you're, you're having a childhood. It was just an unusual childhood, but it was yeah. a childhood nonetheless. Um, right. I played Little League. Right. Uh, I just spent a lot of time at the studios, but I also spent a lot of time back in public school. And I lived about 25 miles away south of L.A., down in the Beach District. So I had totally regular friends with regular stuff and, and went out and did regular things. And then I would occasionally run up to, the, to Hollywood and go behind the studio gates and do some work, which to me was a savings account that I was planning on using on buying a race car because all I ever wanted to be as a kid was a race car driver. You know, some kids wanted to be an astronaut oh, okay. fireman, or but I wanted to be a race car driver. And that's funny because we'll get into the car thing, how that led me down a different path. Um and then also one of the things that I was really, really blessed with at the time I was doing the Munsters was my mom had married a baseball player who was with the L.A. Angels at the time before they were the California Angels. And he had come in from the Yankee organization. His name was Ken Hunt. Um, and so when I wasn't working and I had free time and the baseball season was going on, I got to go out and shag flies with all the major league players in the American League um, for a few years, which was to me was even better than going to the studio. Yeah. Yeah, huh. that that yeah, I can see that. I can see that. that that's that, cool. That had to be surreal. I mean, that's, I was blessed. No, I was a very. I had a wonderful. I couldn't ask for a better childhood. I really couldn't. It was it was the best. Yeah. I had a wonderful time. I met some great people. Had some wonderful experiences. And I'm not like any kid. You don't you don't appreciate it at the time as much as you should have. <laughs> <laughs> so I read that you first did a Kellogg's commercial. Is that right? That's one of the yeah, first what, things you did. What happened was, is that when I was in the second grade, my little sister was very, very pretty and photogenic, and they thought that uh, it would be nice to possibly get her into some print modeling for her father to be influential that would then endorse this gentleman that wanted to be mayor of the city of Gardena. Was the plan was to use Michelle to get Dave to endorse this guy to be mayor. So that was the plan. I went along for the ride during the photo shoot. And when the gentleman named Amos Carr, who was the number one child photographer in Hollywood, was done, he looked over and he says, I like that kid's look. Do you mind if I slap this little hat on him and have him do a pose for me? And I did. My mom said it was okay. And he took that picture and he put it in the window of his, of his studio on Hollywood Boulevard. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, a producer and a director were walking down the street, saw the picture, happened to be in the middle of casting a movie and still looking for the youngest son of Eddie Albert and Jane Wyatt. And Brenda Lee's little brother, and lo, they, they sought me out, and they uh, requested my presence at 20th Century Fox. I went up. I told them I never had any experience, and they said, well, you got to start somewhere. And they hired me for a movie that lasted six weeks, which during that six-week period, I'd got that Kellogg's commercial. And then right after that, I got General Hospital. So within a very short period of time, I accidentally wound up into Hollywood uh, and with a bunch of credits, and I never really looked back. That's pretty good That's stretch. Crazy. Yeah, it was just That's accidental. crazy, man. Well, my mom asked me, Would you like to do this movie? And I go, Well, what's in it? You know, like, what's in it for me? <laughs> she goes, you don't, have to go back to well, you don't have to go back to public school. I went, Okay. <laughs> 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 and you make money for your 
Yeah, really. Don't, don't tempt any kid with not having to go to school. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> And she bribed me with letting me build it. I had this incredibly large slot car track that ran all through the house. That was my one perk that I got. Every every Wednesday, I would go visit George at his shop and go to the hobby store and pick up a couple pieces of the track and whatever I needed to build a slot car. So <laughs> that was that was my Wednesday treat. That's, That's awesome. cool. That's so where, yeah, a, slot car. At, after the movie, yeah. where did you go from, from there? How do you go from that to the monsters to your, your roster of TV shows? Um, What's that like? Mary Grady, the woman who was my only agent I ever had, had just opened up an all-children's agency. And she, it became quite a powerhouse agency in Hollywood. At the time, her only client was her son, Don Grady, who, would, who had actually been hired when she was working for an adult agency. So I was one of, if not her first, I was one of her first clients that actually got some credits. And then she went on to handle Aaron Moran and Johnny Whitaker and, she, and her list and list and list of people is very, very expensive. But I'd like to think that I was one of her first maybe maybe paying clients. And we became friends and I actually lived at her house when my mom was back east living with the uh, my father, the baseball player, got traded to the Washington Senators. So the whole family went east and I was left out on the West Coast working and I moved in with Mary and she let me live with her. We were wow. very close. Um, <clears throat> So one thing led to another, and then after that, um, I just kept going on to interviews, and the more I would go out for interviews, the more work I would get, and it came pretty easily to me. Easily to me, I never took an acting lesson, and I just looked at it as a hobby. It didn't, you know, I was never affected by it. I, like I said, I had another life outside of Hollywood. Back then, it wasn't quite like it is today, where you you get into the publicity machine and you have publicists and you're doing talk shows and you're going to this and you're going to that. I was pretty much isolated out being myself and then i would go in and go to work and that would be about the extent of it yeah 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 that's wild so you you skipped over i mean you told it pretty quick about the monkey's christmas oh yeah uh, tell us about that because i i saw an interview or a piece where you talked about it extensively and it seemed like it was pretty important yeah. to you i it mean was. just working with the monkeys is huge it, what happened was the Beatles had come to the set. I missed meeting the Beatles that day. And I don't you know, you're a 14, I mean, you're an 11-year-old kid back then. And the Beatles came to America. We came out in 64. They came over in 64. But um, when the Monkees, when I did the Monkees episode, it was the end of 67. I think it aired right at the beginning of 68. So I was 13 years old, which was, they were huge. They had a TV show. Their music was big. They were they were as big as the Beatles in America. They were, they were really top-notch. So I normally would never tell anybody in school when I got a part. It was very much my private world and I kept it out of, you know, in, out of out of anybody's, you know, crosshairs. When I got the interview and I got hired for the monkeys, everybody in the eighth grade knew about it. Everybody. Because <laughs> I was so proud of myself that I pulled this off. Normally, <laughs> normally I, 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 did, I give it my best shot. I go home. If I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. This one I really wanted. I really wanted it bad. And when I wound up doing it, then the idea of the script was I was working as an equal with them because they were hired to babysit me. So I was in almost every scene with them. And it wasn't like, you know, you just walk in, you have one scene, and you go home. I was there for three days working long hours with these guys. And I was just happy as could be. They were all very, very nice. I'm still friends with Mickey. I was friends with Davey and Peter. Uh, Mike, I met, but, you know, he was kind of like the one that went another direction. But it was a really great time. And I, honestly, I think it's the best episode they ever did as well. Not because I'm in it, just the way the structure of the show that they sang at the end, a cappella, and then they broke down the fourth wall and invited all the people that made the show a success on camera. And what they, oh, wow. how they showed that and the enthusiasm, it literally, it literally mirrored exactly what it was like to be around those guys. They were just a fun, happy set with a bunch of great guys having a great time in 1968. That's cool. Oh, shit. I remember watching the monkeys. I remember yeah. the monkeys. Yeah. yeah I remember I it too. Good. I mean, it was pretty cool. When you think were... about, uh, you got, you got the monsters, you got the monsters cars, the coach, mm -hmm. Dragula. Yeah. Then right after that, George is doing the Batmobile 66 or so. Yeah. Then he's got the monster mobile. Monster I mean, coach. you think about that time frame and the artwork and how things just, I mean, you couldn't do that again in a five or eight year period now. It's no. Just, it's pretty crazy. And the popularity, I mean, granted, back then there was only three channels and you could, you, know, you could switch over to UHF and all that down the road. But I mean, that, that was a big deal. I'm sure the people that watched the monsters was probably, how many was it? 15, 20 million. Butch, do you know on well, any given time? 
we had a, I don't remember the market share, but there was only three channels in most of the country. In the Midwest, uh, prime time started at 6.30. We were the 7.30 East Coast, West Coast, 6.30 leadoff show on Thursday night. But people don't realize, or, you know, these kids don't realize, is back in the old days, the TV guide was the entertainment Bible for the household during the week. Um, weekends, not so much. People would go out, they go to movies, they would have other things to do. But during the week, Monday through Friday, the um, TV guide was, was gospel. And the Munsters was a very popular show. And it was family, it was funny, but it was well-produced. And it had this interesting blend of the Leave it to Beaver scripts from the producers of Leave it to Beaver with the Universal Monster sets and the Car 54 cast of Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis with the movie star quality of Yvonne DiCarlo. And you mun they mushed it all in with this beautiful blonde that thought she was unfortunate and homely. And you had this crazy <laughs> script that on paper, you wouldn't think it would be so good, but it right. just, it, it, it hit gold because people... They loved the chemistry of the family unit. They really enjoyed the, they were entertained. They thought the stories were great and they, uh, it became a huge hit. And it was a one of a kind, one off show that's never been done since in 57 years. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. So for you were doing, it was two, only two years, the monsters 35. So it's 70 shows total. That's jam. -packed. That's a lot of work in a short period of time. What, yeah, the, what was your day year, like? Yeah. The, the first year we actually did 39. Uh, and then the second year when they backed it off to 31, they kind of knew what was going to be going off the air. And Fred's health was, was getting a little thin. Literally, he was, you know, he was a tall, skinny guy to begin with. But what they decided to do is in lieu of the last eight episodes is they made a movie, the Munster Go Home movie. So they filled that. Yep, two I remember that. Yeah, they, and they also made it in color. And the idea was behind it, they were thinking syndication was, was coming around the corner. And they decided they needed a movie to introduce the Munsters to the rest of the world to then be able to uh, sell the Munsters TV show as a package. So they used the movie as oh, a yeah. calling card, so to speak. I got you. So what, how many hours a day were you? I mean, you had to put in a lot of time as a kid, did you not? Well, you're only allowed to work like eight hours a day. So you got eight hours of work and one hour of uh, lunch. So I would get there at eight. I'd be in makeup from eight to nine. I usually would hit school from about nine to 11 if, they, if possible. And then they would do a little filming before lunch, go to lunch for an hour, come back, get that other hour of school in somehow. They, then you'd have an hour of recreation, whether it was two half hour breaks or one hour, and then they would have another two or three hours of filming. But the key to me was I had two extra hours on each end because I had an hour drive to work and an hour drive home at the, at the end of the day. But um, in the summertime, when if you ever see an episode where Eddie, where Eddie is featured and he's in a lot of scenes, that was done in summer when they had an extra three hours that they didn't have to apply to school. They would apply that to camera time. So they would write scripts that would load up Eddie. So whenever all the kids were on summer vacation, that's when I was working. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Albert, no, I had a crush on Beverly Owen, the first Maryland. The other one. Oh, that's right. There was two Marylands. I forgot that. Ken, yeah. do, you have, do you have that one or no? Do I have the No, I mean, Ken. He, he, Ken, Ken was pulling up the pictures. Oh yeah, and behind I, the scenes. I had, a, I had a crush. I had a crush on on uh on that Yvonne DiCarlo. That's 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 who I had my uh, crush. On. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had my crush. On. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of interesting things that went in. If you watch the Munsters, it's funny why why it's so popular this day. Number one, the production value was very strong. It was shot on film. We used the sets from the original Frankenstein. We had great sets. We had very funny guest stars early in their comedic careers. Big stars, you know, Paul Lynn, Don Rickles. Uh, Frank Gorshin, Harvey Corman, Richard Deacon. I mean, there's a very extensive list of quality. Wow. Jane, Wh Jane Withers. Uh, we had a lot of people come through the show, and, uh, and we had some very, very funny world class episodes. The George Barris Cars music. If you listen to the soundtrack, we had a killer soundtrack. It was really, really well produced. And I think that's what really keeps the show. The, uh, the viewership there, that it was a fun show for the obvious reasons, but the quality and the production value makes it um, legendary. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's time. It's timeless. It really yeah. is because you get, you could find episodes on YouTube, I'm sure. And, and someone posted up in the, uh, the comments that the episode with you and the monkeys is on YouTube too. Yeah. YouTube's so it's, it's, it's definitely floating around. Yeah, YouTube has been a phenomenon in its own right. I'm actually developing a couple of YouTube channels myself. Everybody is. It's not like this, but at least with YouTube, you literally can do what networks were doing 50, 60 years ago individually. Yeah. And, you, know, you can pretty much 
create stuff. Technology's there. The fans are there. People, there's a lot of people that have never, ever turned on a TV set. You know, they've gotten everything yeah. through the internet. Yeah, that's yeah. that's one of the few shots there without the widow's peak. Yeah, that right? happened, that was what happened there. There was only one scene done with that scene without the widow's peak, and that was the scene where uh, uh, we all had the love potion, and I'm running home from school with all the girls chasing me, yeah. and as I run into the <laughs> gate, I don't have a widow's peak, and they stop production, and they go, "He's not believable as the offspring of Permanent Lily. We need to make him more monstery." Mike Westmore took me up to the lab. He created some eyebrows for me and he came up with a widow's peak. And then we went back and started shooting again. And that's the Eddie that that's a very rare non widow's peak, um, uh, press shot. I read that the, another kid did the, uh, pilot, that it wasn't you. What's the story behind that? Is it true? Yeah, there was two, it was a different mom and there was a different kid. Uh, Lily's name was Phoebe. The Herman's wife's name was Phoebe and her name was Joan Marshall. She had very long, straight black hair, very similar to Morticia Adams. And the, the fact that Happy Derman was playing the uh, role really um, angry. You know, he was probably taking direction. He was probably doing the best that the director told him to do. But he, you know, he was growling and snarling. And, you know, and they decided that, that they thought that the rest of the family was very normal. And I think they wanted the kid to be a normal kid as well. Looking different, but still normal. And then yeah. they, Carlo had star power, so she was offered the role, and they thought that it was a bad choice, Fred and Al, but she turned out to be a great choice because she did comedy really well, and she was a big name. Hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you have any crazy uh, monster on set stories that we wouldn't know about that you remember? Not, you know, something, not really, and, I, and I'm sure some stuff happened, but, it, you know, it, the stuff that would be worth yeah. Repeating, it probably happened while I was in school. <laughs> Number yeah. one, I wasn't privy to it. I mean, the one thing happened that I remember when Fred Wynn drove the car off the set uh, you know, onto Lancashire Boulevard down to Coenga and made a little joyride, and, you know, <laughs> unauthorized, and came back about 20 minutes later as the sun was setting because the idea was they told him, don't do this. And you tell Fred not to do something, you're just asking for trouble. So they told him to turn around and come right back. And he w drove out the front gate of Universal. Now, the funny thing is, is you know, the car is really not that dependable. And we don't yeah. know how much gas is in it. And it doesn't have taillights. And, and la, 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 la. You know, like, really <laughs> things, yeah, yeah. Really things could have gone wrong. But we made it down. And we made a U-turn. We came back about, you know, 10 minutes later. And, of course, everybody's still standing around waiting for us to return, which we did. <laughs> and uh, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> Can you That's imagine awesome. seeing that? Can you imagine That's being awesome. on, checking that, that is out? So awesome! Yeah. If you're on your phone. Swipe left, swipe right. Kevin Warner. I don't know what that means. I, I don't know. Oh, they can't. <laughs> some. I, it's probably to add. Someone wants to turn up the Facebook. The fa uh, captions on Facebook. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Riding into Munson's coach is a oh, blast. Close as the. Uh, so. I mean, the administrator of my fan group, all 28,000 members. Ah, oh, Lois. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So, what car do you own any, any, uh, any cars? Yeah, I have a Munster coach, and I, 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 I bought a Munster coach and a Dragula, not obviously a George Barris one, but uh, a gentleman named Rucker Posey uh, built a couple that I became friends with, and I wound up buying his setup. And then I'm building a more accurate Dragula with a small block Ford and a 500 horse Jake's stroker motor. Which will be done at the end of the year, and then I'm my my coach is under contract, and I'm building another monster coach. So when I hand the keys over next October, I'll have a replacement coach with the small block board. Will be more accurate. But when I had a chance to buy the cars, I immediately knew I was onto something really really good because I knew that I could take these cars and my love of the fans instead of just going to comic cons and and trotting in with a briefcase full of autographed pictures. I could now have a 34 foot trailer with two cars tour the country. Yeah of events become an event status situation and one of the, the best things that, that ever happened was i was the first truck and car into the superdome and i pulled in and i got out and i looked around i go man i've arrived when, you, when you're the first <laughs> thing into the superdome you know that's wild because, because the most space i was like a kid in a candy store i got, I got to cut the ribbon at the uh, woodward dream cruise a few years ago the first car of four hundred thousand cars down the road so i really really like it because you know John Schneider's got a general lead and he does his thing, but 
you know, Batman didn't ride around in a Batmobile. And, uh, you know, it's to have to have the Munster coach and be Eddie Munster and be able to go out and talk to promoters and cities and clients and do stuff. It's really a cool fit. Yeah. It allows yeah. Me to, to travel, which is what which my, my podcast and my YouTube channel is all about. It's called Coach to Coast with K. And it's very much like Charles Corral used to do in the 70s. His uh, traveling yep. America yep. and, loving, and <clears throat> loving Americana. And that's what I do. Dude, that's cool. That's real cool. Thank you. So yeah. a- after yeah. you're on the Monsters yeah. and you start to do other shows, how do you, I mean, I guess you just auditioned, you got those jobs. Yeah. Is Mon- Monkey's Christmas your favorite? Talk to us about that time frame. What well, was life like? I, I like that because of the Monkeys, but after the, you know, I, some of my favorite shows happened after I was 16. You know, I remember Marcus Welby was cool and, uh, that was right when the, they, they landed on the moon. That was a big day. And, and the Robert Young let us stop work and watch the moon landing. We had cameras all over. They, they landed in the afternoon. They didn't really walk on it until about 11 o'clock that night. So we saw the landing about four in the afternoon. And I, and I thought that was so cool that he shut down production and let everybody enjoy that. Um, I remember when I was working when, when Kennedy got shot. It was, it was a horrible day. And the director said, oh, come on, everybody back to work. You know, and he, he was a real dick about it, you know. So yeah. working, it's, it's fun to be, you know, you, you have good sets and bad sets. I've been very blessed. 99% of the time I was on a good set. The Munsters probably being the best. Um, Lidsville was an interesting situation there because it was a very modern chroma key set. We had off, we had voices from people off screen. We had a director on another soundstage uh, directing us through a God mic. You wouldn't have any personal contact with him. It was all done by Big Brother. <laughs> Charles Nelson Riley was a handful. <laughs> but the good news about it was is that hat people, most of them I knew the little people in those hats because they were my stand-ins at one time or another as I was growing up in Hollywood. They would never use another kid to stand in for another kid. You always had little people. So I, you know, several of the little people were friends of mine, and that made it fun. Yeah, yeah, because you, you went in there knowing somebody. Yeah. yeah, and and I and I and I made I made good friends with uh, with uh, Sharon Baird was was Raunchy Rabbit and uh, let me see we had Billy Hayes you know who was legendary as Witchy Poo and Weenie Genie and she did <laughs> Mammy Yoakum on Broadway and um, at the time I'm a you know a 17 year old kid turning 18 doing a kids show I wasn't the happiest camper but they they paid me handsomely and I knew that it would come in handy for my funny car that I was about to buy and go drag racing. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> So Did you get the funny problem. car? We had a little problem with that. What happened was I got number 41 in the last year of the Vietnam lottery, and I thought I was going to Vietnam, so I uh, decided to spend all my money before I got before I got killed. And then I didn't, oh, go. I didn't go to Vietnam because I had ba- I had a bad knee that I wasn't aware of, so at my induction uh, examination, they said, oh, man, you got a bad knee. Call us in six months. You're classifying your 1H, not fit for duty. Six months went by. I didn't remind them to call me. And they, I never heard from them again. <laughs> so there went, Whoa. There, went, there went the funny car. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Butch, why. I, that's forgive why. my ignorance. Have you written a book about your life? And I, are you going to? I will eventually. I have a monster. I have a really good monsters book. Um, there was a book written about 15 years ago um, that was sort of a biography, but it wasn't as accurate as I would have liked it. People enjoyed it. Uh, at the time I wasn't quite myself that I am today. I was still in my disease and partying and drinking too much. So, uh, people that know me, I've, I'm going to have 11 years, 11 years sober here in November. So I want to do the book now, uh, maybe next year because I have a whole different look and my life is much different than it was, uh, 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. I got you. That makes sense. You might as well, I mean, you do it while you have a clear mind. Clear mind. I'm a cancer survivor. I do things differently now. I'm, a, I'm in a much different place. But it's great to know you're here now so you can – because I was out partying for 41 years. I started in 1969, and I didn't stop, you know, until 2010. So that's a hell of a Man. run. But that's was, a hell of a run. But it, it was like – but it wasn't, it wasn't abnormal. Everybody in Hollywood was partying. It was, it was what people did. It was the 60s and the 70s. And it's yeah, hard to it's true. That. It's hard to explain that when bad behavior was 
acceptable and nobody ever said no to anybody and nobody ever told Elvis no nobody ever told Michael Jackson no I'm not equating myself to that I'm just saying the lifestyle yeah. is and everybody right wanted to right money. and for me being at the beach I wanted to be accepted by my friends and the way I did that was throwing the best parties and always having a bag of weed and a bunch of beer in the fridge and you know things went on from there right <laughs> right yeah I get it I mean it's it's it's, it's crazy you know when in Rome that, that, that's that's all there, yeah when in rome yeah that's all there is to that. it's funny some yeah. of my best friends now are old old rock and rollers and party guys that they got sober too it's a very cool club to be part of <laughs> <laughs> you'd be surprised how many people are sober that you know we don't publicize it too much because i just mentioned it to you but as you as you get it more into it you find more and more very cool people that were big ass partiers who came out the other side okay a lot of us didn't a lot of us, a lot of us. Died. Yeah, a lot didn't. Yeah, yeah, you're right. What, a lot what, did not. What drove you to that point to where you you sobered up? What was the event, or what what made you go? Okay, enough's enough, or whatever. It was, it was it snuck up on you. I knew I knew I needed help probably five years before I actually dropped the rock and sought help. And I had a friend, a good friend that I used to party with, and I would contact him once in a while and ask him how he was doing and tippy toe around the idea. And then finally, uh, a friend of mine said. You know, you need help, and I got a place that wants to sponsor you, and he wants to get a child actor sober. And his name was Jim Antonowicz, and he owned Oasis Treatment Center out in Anaheim, right next to Disneyland. Had a, He was the original interventionist for the A&E show Intervention. And yeah. He, he quit doing that show because they wanted him to get a sober intake uh, client drunk for the cameras, and he wouldn't do it. He goes, no, they show yeah, it I don't sober. Blame him. They show no. it sober, they're staying sober. So he parted ways with the... Uh, with the A and E network, but he always wanted to get a child uh, actor sober so that they could help other people. And he and I, I, they, we opened up the yellow pages. Oasis jumped off the page. They called the woman, answered the phone. She put me in touch with. They put my people in touch with Jim, and they flew me out there. And he waived my, uh, he waived my uh, uh, fee, which would have been like thirty five thousand dollars. And I gave it a shot. And like every other <clears throat> addict, alcoholic, after a few weeks, I was ready to leave. And they kind of talk you back into, you know, don't go anywhere. There was no locks on the doors. You could have walked away anytime you want. And I wound up staying three years. And in three years, the first 90 days, you get nine months of treatment in 90 days because the 28-day thing doesn't work for anybody, and he knew it. And we became friends, and now I've reached millions of people. And um, his only prerequisite was he wanted someone that hadn't been going on the rehab merry-go-round with multiple failures. I had never been in a rehab. So his father, right. Mike, I'd never been in rehab. And I and I agreed to listen to him and, t and do what he said to do, and it worked. Wow! <laughs> Never had a relapse. Wow, that's pretty. Damn that's good. impressive, man. Yeah, he says once in a while, once in a while, a burning bush experience can happen to a spiritually awakened person, and that all desires to use and and party are all just removed from your being, and that's what happened to me. I got very very lucky. Wow. <laughs> So I read somewhere, saw somewhere, you did a movie, Sandlot General in Brazil, and your yeah. sisters, I think, were quoted as saying that you left as Richie Cunningham, came back as John Lennon. Yeah. That is that is that a transition period? And what the hell happened? Well, what, what can you, I mean, to help people out there, what, what took place between? Imagine, the, imagine this little window of opportunity. <clears throat> 1969, okay. Uh, I, I, I watched the moon landing on, I think it was July 20th, August 2nd is my birthday. I get my Mach 1, 16 years old, brand new Mach 1. My girlfriend lives up in the top of Laurel Canyon, uh, Woodrow Wilson Drive. Charlie Manson's out murdering people. It's a crazy summer. It's a really, really weird summer. A friend of mine has an interview to go up for this movie that's being done in Brazil. I drive him to the interview. As he comes out of the door, I'm waiting in the waiting room, and the producer goes, Butch Patrick. I go, yeah. He goes, you got a minute. I go, yeah. He hires me for the job that I drove my friend up for the interview. I want, I want to get the job. Three days later, I'm in Brazil. No teacher. What a pal. What a pal. No, no parent. No teacher. No parent. All I got to do is show up for work at the lobby. We got a French camera crew. We got a Chinese caterer. We got uh, Brazilian actors and crew. And for the next three months, I'm down there. And all I have to do is show up for work. So I'm partying at night. I, be, I make friends with the sailors who've got the, the Navy ships there. So I'm, I'm smuggling cigarettes off the ships. I'm, I'm exchanging currency for them. And I found a, a cab driver who, bought, who sold me weed. So I got weed, pot, 
and cigarettes all go in on the black market in Brazil. Well, I'm doing this. <laughs> and I come back, and I'm going out to the red light district with the, with the French camera crew at night. I'm 16. I look about 12. And when I came back, <laughs> that's when my sister said, he left his Richard Kennedy game and he came back as John Lennon because I, I was a different person, and I was off to the races in the party mode of a 19, late 1969, 1970 uh, Hollywood. And that's how it was. Wow. I'm telling you, it would make a, a fantastic yeah. book if you write all, I mean, just the, the, mm -hmm. just the fact that the Manson that summer living through that. It was, it was the craziest time anybody could have ever imagined in that window. And uh, yeah, it was, it was great. I, it was, I was very blessed. I, you know, I had cool girls and girlfriends and fast cars and lived at the beach and surfing. And it was like I say, it was a good time. Too good. What'd sometimes. you think of Brazil outside of all that you were doing? What'd you think oh, of the country? Well, I, we went to Rio. We went up to Salvador. It was beautiful. I mean, it was a really interesting place. It was, you know, kind of like a, definitely a culture shock. Very much of a culture oh, shock. Oh, yeah. But nice people, great music, uh, good, you know, batida, which is like cashew liqueur. And uh, and they we, we also had some Brazilian stars, adorable Caimi. Uh, we had Galera Man Lamanera and Adamir da Silva, um, Ileana Pittman. We had a lot of good stuff. We had Alejandro Ray was with was you know the Carlos from the Flying Nun. Mm -hmm. He was down there with us. Kent Lane, uh, Tisha Sterling. It was a great movie. But what, unfortunately, what happened when the movie came out, it won a bunch of awards, and I was going to be up for an, an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor, you know. But the guy had a Hollywood divorce with Rhonda Fleming, and she got half. The, she, in the judgment, she he had to give her half the money from the movie, and he got mad and he shelved it, so he never released the movie. Are you kidding me? Yep. Oh, uh, dude. Yeah, I was up at the, I was up at the house, and Rhonda and, and Hall had a horrible divorce, and and he was so mad at her that this eleven years he'd worked his life to make this movie before he would give her a red cent, he shelved it. Hmm. Wow. We had billboards on Sunset Boulevard and everything. And then, you know, I got the trades were for your consideration, which Patrick best supporting actor. And I was going to be a movie star, you know, and it, and it just all went yeah. out. And then I wound up doing Lidsville, nothing against Lidsville, but I went from movie star to Saturday morning. And it was like, it kind of like, I think it's time to get out of the business. Yeah. 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 yeah, a game yeah it, it's a big letdown. It's a big letdown. It was, and well, you know, the main thing that did it was I'd worked for 15 years and I, I wondered, when do I get to the point where they start mailing me scripts or at least you don't have to go through the process of the normal cattle call? Well, not a cattle call, but a normal interview yeah. process. I was hoping that I might be able to get a little bit ahead of the game. Uh, but back then, that's not how it worked. Yeah, at least, at least I not got you. Butch, I, I saw somewhere that uh, you actually hung out with Sally Fields. But she was the no, flying no, nun. No, no. Was was that? Sally, no, Sally Fields was coming on the set of the monkeys to visit Davy Jones. Oh. They were, they were an item. And uh, she would come over, and I thought it was very cute. And it was like when I was at Universal, Sandra D and Bobby Darren were the uh, heart, you know, they were like the, the Hollywood couple. <laughs> and they were always out at Universal. So it was, but no, I never hung out with Sally Fields. Oh, that's still pretty cool. I mean, it's yeah, still it in cool. that yeah. circle. I mean, you're talking icons. I mean, that's, that's, Unbelievable. I, I walk down Hollywood Boulevard and I look at the stars sometimes on this on this on the pavement and it's amazing how many of them you've either worked with or have sat down in you know some uh, some event or or commissary and it's amazing how many people cross your paths when you're in Hollywood it's not that big of a town. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I got another question for you then. With all that said about the way it's been going. Yeah. What about there's there's vicious rumors running around of a remake of the monsters where, where I guess Rob Zombie's going to direct it, or is he going to be in it, or are you going to be a part of that? He's in it. Uh, he's in. Well, no, he's not in it. He's got the rights to it. He's directing it. That is correct. Not a vicious rumor. It's going to be great. Um, I uh, I do know Rob. He and I were hired to do commentary on the new Monster Go Home Blu-ray a couple of years ago. So we sat and chatted. I'd met him. 15 years before in Philadelphia at a concert and um, great guy. Ser Sherry Moon's awesome. What a great couple. And I am very comfortable that the world is going to be pleasantly surprised at what he presents to the world as a monster movie. I think it's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. The dude, I met him, I met him about 
10, 12 years ago. Super cool guy. Yeah, yeah. We talked for like 10, 15 minutes. Super nice guy, man. Super talented, super knowledgeable. <clears throat> Big Munsters fan. Loves the Munsters. I was in Connecticut. I took my Munster coach over to his house. We went for a – I let him drive it and went for a cruise through town. Sherry sat in the back. Um, we communicate. He, there is – there is. I am going to do something in the movie. I can't discuss it. But, um, right. I get as, that. As is Pat Priest. As is Pat Priest. So, yeah, I'm very, very happy about it for the next year or so. It's a huge buzz. He's actually – I have a new uh, YouTube channel called All Things Munster. And, of course, my first segment when I launch it will be Rob Zombie and the Munster Project. Right. And, and the second one will be uh, George Barris, my, my, uh, my life with George, Uncle George, as I would call him. And then the third one is I have a show called Macabre Theater with a co-host called Ivana Cadaver, who's a dear friend of mine. And we've been doing this. This is about a 20-year project that's been on and off. Uh, she's had it on the air for the last, I think, 15 years straight called Macabre Theater, Ivana Cadaver. So that'll be the third segment. So it's going to be all things Munster because there's such a buzz going on right now about it. Yeah. And in a good way. No, that's cool. Yeah. But let's talk more about Barris. I was lucky enough to spend, yeah. uh, I don't know, it was probably six or seven hours in his shop one day. I uh, did an interview with him. And he was a fantastic storyteller. I mean, he had me laughing so hard on certain subjects. It, it was just pretty crazy. And he showed me, he had the Wall of Fame where he showed me the cars yeah. that he built for, for people. He told me a cool story about Frank Sinatra. He said Frank Sinatra asked to have his windows tinted way back in the day. It's before, before film, of course, the, you know, the tint. He said, Frank said, make it dark, make it real dark. I don't want people to see me in my car. He says, you won't be able to see. He goes, I don't care. I don't care. He says the next day, Frank Sinatra comes back. He goes, listen, I almost ran into three cars. Get this shit off my windows. I can't see. <laughs> but George told us, I mean, he was so colorful. Every sure. time I turned around, he had me laughing my ass off as to what he was doing. I told people Perfect. to do it. I, I had George sign off. He gave me the rights to his life story for two years. I had a two-year option. I thought I was I was skipping out the door when I got that option because I thought there was no way that anybody isn't going to want to make this movie of George Barris's life. And honestly, everybody that I approached thought he was too old. They didn't appreciate it. They did, the, the, what it was, it was the younger kids in Hollywood that were in a position of power at that time to greenlight a project could care less about George Barris. And that, yeah. That, I convinced them how wrong they were. I tried to convince them about car clubs, how strong car clubs are, how organized they are, what a god he is to the car clubs. I go, the man's Rolodex in Hollywood is has nobody has more connections in Hollywood that has that can know George Barris than anybody. I mean, I, I would put his Rolodex against anybody of, of knowing stars. Oh, yeah, and they just yeah. didn't get, they just didn't get it. And, and it was well, so it's crazy. because it's because they don't they don't see money in it, man. Because when I was when I was doing my first TV show, they uh I you know the the guy that owned the company he said that Carol Shelby gave him the rights to his life, and I said to him, "How come you didn't do the show?" And he just said flat out, "There's no money in it." Yeah, they don't. Well, they don't. They they don't know. They don't think there's any. It's, I'll give you an example. I tell people right now when they hire me, Munsters, and they they go, well, "I don't know if you know the kids are going to know who the Munsters are." The first the first. Uh, personal appearance I ever did when I bought my cars was Daytona Dodge. Randy uh, Randy Dye, the great guy, ex NASCAR driver, and a friend of mine, uh, Brian Ryder, set up the deal and he hired me to come down. And when I got there, he goes, "I got to tell you, because I didn't think anybody, the kids were going to know who you were, but you know what I did? I walked through my entire complex, and he had a big complex, and every person I asked, whether they were a mechanic or a secretary or a car washer, whatever they were doing." Do you know who the Munsters are? He goes, every person knew who the Munsters were. So I told yeah. I tell people, I go, you know, you may not, you're going to, you're going to be pleasantly surprised because you're very much underestimating the power and the brand identification, the brand and the brand knowledge of the word, the Munsters people are, mm -hmm. very, it's a very unusual situation, very unique, but the world knows who this is. And that's why I tell people, I go, if I wanted to go out and just go on the road for the rest of my life and just do car shows, I would never, ever run out of meeting people and sell them. The T-shirt you got, I could sell a million of those. Literally. Oh, I mean, yeah. I yeah. Never, oh, it's a cool shirt. I mean, I everybody saw run, this cool shit. I, yeah, I will never run out of a Munster fan base to go out and meet people because it makes them feel good. Uh, the adults like watching it with their kids and their grandkids and their grandparents and the hot rods. But in the hot rod circle, I'm like, 
an A-lister, you know, in the rest of the world, I'm, you know, I'm a B minus and a lister, but in the real, in the hot rod world, the Munster coach and me were A-listers. So yeah. stay where you're strong, stay in the automotive world. I like it. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Dead man's curve, yeah. a perfect example. Yeah. Yeah. It was a nice show. We, we Brian and I member, should have showed up on Saturday. It was, yeah, we, it was a big. Best big. car club in the world. And they made me a member and I, and I, they hired me to come out and they've had, you know, everybody that's anybody has been there. And now I'm a member of this club. And I'm telling you, hot rods are a very strong group of guys and they, and they love what they do. And, and the Munsters is a big draw and they like it. And I like my car. So I'm, you know, I'm very comfortable doing what I do. I've, I've carved out, I carved out a very cool little niche for myself. Yeah. Yeah. Lois was plugging the uh, website or the Facebook page. Um, you you want to run through that, Butch? Because yeah. I think we skipped the, over it. The Facebook well, what's page. The, yeah, the Facebook page. What's it called? Well, I've got Butch Patrick and Butch Patrick, too. But the main thing is you go to Munsters.com. I've had that almost 30 years. And everything that I have, everything that I'm doing, the schedule, the store, the merch, um, the Rob Zombie stuff, everything can be found at monsters.com it's the easiest way to do it because it's easiest to remember right and that makes yeah, sense you know we got the instagram and you know we got twitter and all that stuff but I'm, I'm not really a big social media person at that level i have some people to do it like i say lois runs the thing howard stern loves the monsters john five rob zombie paul mccartney i mean he caught me front row center tickets um it's like it's got this draw of people that alice cooper's a big fan um he actually invited me. He goes, when are you going to come up on stage with me? And I go, really? And I go, I'm holding you to it. I go, this is this. <laughs> I saw you when I was 19 years old, you know, and I'm coming back and I'm coming up on stage, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> I've, yeah. seen, I, I, I've seen him at Barrett Jackson out at oh, Scottsdale. Yeah. Great guy. One of, one of my yeah, he's a car guy. Yeah, he's, he's a car guy, too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'm very lucky. I've been very blessed. It's been a great ride. People come up to me and say, you ever get tired of doing it? I go, you know, no, I don't. And I go, you know why? Because in this day and age, if you can bring some joy to some people by answering a couple questions and posing for a picture and and sharing these memories of how much the show meant to these people and how part you were part of their extended family when things were tough, mm -hmm. how can you not? I mean, the, the one of the best stories I ever had was I went into a radio station in Florida and the girl at the receptionist cute little girl too she goes i gotta tell you mr patrick you were my uh, imaginary friend when i was a kid i had a really bad depression and whenever i got really really depressed i would go watch the monsters by myself and i would cut it would bring me out of my depression i mean wow so how do you dude how that's do you, huge how do you not feel good about that yeah yeah it's yeah yeah two years of my life 57 years ago and people are still gathering and for me the, the little the little thing where the statement where I had a beard and, and it gets dissolved and Herman gives the little talk about, did you learn anything? It's, you know, it's not what you look like. It's the strength of your car, the, you know, the size of your character and the strength of your heart. That thing gets a hundred million views about every few months because it rains. It resonates perfectly into the world we live in today. Yeah. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a life lesson. You know what I mean? It's, it's just that simple. It's a life lesson. Yeah. What happened That's to Wolf Wolf? Where's what you still number got one, Wolf Wolf? Number one asked question of all time. Where's Wolf Wolf? <laughs> he's in he's in Indiana, but before he wound up in Indiana, I made a mold of him and we sold about 120 of them back in the 80s to uh, collectors. And I've got Wolf, I've got two of them. I've got Son of Wolf Wolf, and then I've got another version of Wolf Wolf that we're currently selling at at Munsters.com. <laughs> wow. I have to get a Wolf Wolf. I got I got to... I got a couple granddaughters. I'm gonna have to get a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> probably not cheap. Only 120. Probably not cheap if you can find one. No, they're they're, right? they're kind of pricey, but um, but you can find them on eBay. I've seen I've seen them double in price, and I've seen them 25 percent of what we sold them for. So if you look around, and there's a lot of other ones too, you'll find a wolf buff at an affordable price. Yeah, but, I'm but I, 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 guys, I'm, I know that I know that we said something yeah. that's pretty much over my time here. I got you. Yeah, I, I wanted to thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Anything else you want to you want to talk about before you run out? Where you, where you're going? Where you're going to be? Well, it's the best thing to do is just go to Munsters.com for the schedule. But yeah, I can tell you real quickly. Uh, I'm going to be at Horror Hound uh, this weekend in Cincinnati, and then I'll be down in Tennessee at the Smokey and the Bandit Run. With leading up to the weekend after that in Springfield, Illinois, at the Route 66 Mother Road Car Show. It's going to be a big one. 
And then after that, it's Detroit, Indianapolis, Myrtle Beach, New Orleans, and Denver for the month of October. All cool. Yeah. Butch, we appreciate yeah. you coming on. It was fantastic. You're a piece Thanks. of history. Write the book. Thanks, I'll be guys. first in line I'll, to get it. I will do that book thing, I think. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Talk Butch. To you later. Thanks, Thanks for coming Butch. on. Appreciate Bye, it, man. Thank you. Thank you. Dude, that was awesome. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm so jazzed about this. <laughs> That's history right there. So jazzed. That's history. Can yeah, it's, imagine? it's good history. And the thing is, he's a car guy. That's what makes it so awesome. He's got to log it. He's got to write. He's got to put that on paper and put it out there so people can oh, yeah. read. Yeah. Because when he talks about 1969, you know you forget. You're like, okay, I know what happened this week, but you don't know. You don't remember what Manson, the man on the moon, Kennedy. Yeah. You know, almost felt like it was a, a, a Forrest Gump running through history there of being at the right place, right time. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. And Lois, there's Lois. Yeah, she's got so. it. She she posted. She's got a woof woof. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the page. Next week we yeah. got Faye. Faye, you want to talk about Faye? Yes, Faye. Um, she did. She's she's doing all girls garage, but she just it was like it's like three weeks, maybe three weeks old. Motor Mythbusters on Disco. So she's doing that. So she's hosting two shows. Super super nice lady. Super nice lady. I, I met Faye once in Detroit ro at Roadkill Nights three years ago. And uh, she was just an, a nice person, man. She's cool. I like her. I really do like her. And I think she's out of Texas. But she does, um, she's got some deal where she helps vets fix their cars and stuff. Well, we'll get into that. I, I, don't, I don't know all the details on that. But I know she does that. And she does a bunch of stuff. She's really cool. Yeah, she's really cool. Before we jet, I wanted to uh, thank Brian. I know Brian's still on. Brian Ryder. He's the one that put all this together. He's uh, Butch's buddy. Yeah. So he's the one that got us uh, Butch on the show, which is cool. It's Ryder Graphics. Check it out if you don't know already. That's his company. That's so, cool. Yeah. Uh, week a after Faye, yeah, a week after Faye, we got Will Lockwood from yep. Bitch and Rides coming on. Yeah. Uh, right now, Tori, he sent me a text trying to lock down uh, Paul Sr. for the 29th, the week after. But he said he's tied up doing a 9-11 event in New York. Yeah. So it's yeah. hit and miss as far as you know him uh, getting back. Yeah. But we'll get him. If it's not that week, we'll get him after. So 29th yeah. right now is, is still open. I tried to hit yeah, and all we got um. I, I did a uh, I did a group text with everybody, so we we might have a guy like a a master gunsmith, and we're gonna, we'll talk about we'll talk about some cool stuff, you know, Second Amendment stuff, building guns in today's world. I think it'd be pretty cool. So I think I think you guys, you know, for guys for you guys who are into weapons, I think it'd be a really good show. Too short. So. It's an hour. We had an hour here, Rod. <laughs> <laughs> he he wanted for to turn it in. Butch said he wanted to do a half, a half hour, and we kept him going. So <laughs> yeah, he told a good story too. He did. It was awesome. Yeah, it yep. is cool. All right, I'm gonna jet because uh, I just uh, I'm gonna kill this. Wait, whoa, All right, a little bit here. I'm gonna. All right, I'm, so I'm gonna on. close it. Shut, shut up for a second. <laughs> All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the show. Butch, it was great to have you on. Real car guy. It's a shame we didn't get to talk more about cars. I really wanted to. But, hey, you know, John was running this one. He's, he's trying to keep me between the lines. Hope you have a good time. Next week, we've got Faye. She is the one of the hosts of All Girls Garage and the new show on Discovery, or, uh, Motor Mythbusters. So she's out there. She's really cool. You'll see her next week. Everybody have a great time. I'm Lou, and I'm out. Later. Ever wonder what happened to your favorite Hollywood stars? Some are screen legends. That's a Cadillac. Some made history. What do you say? Is it the new blues mobile or what? One thing's for sure, they all have more to tell. Road trip with me, Lou Santiago, as I hunt down these iconic cars. The cars actually stolen. My kids said, Dad, you're not going to believe what's over here. And take you behind the scenes. To get the story behind the story. I'm gonna have the car do the same thing. Oh, bang. Wow.
from the designers who built them, the stars that drove them, and the lucky motherfuckers who stumbled across them. Where was his car when he found it? Pull in there. Pull in there. Dude, tell me you have your hands on it. You're not going to believe some of this stuff.